Hey, welcome to Shader Park. So today we're going to be going over some of the core language. And before we get started, there's two main links that I want to point you to. The first, if you scroll down on our homepage, is a link to our Discord. So if you have any questions while you're getting started, feel free to reach out to us here. And I'll also include a link in the description. The second is a link to our interactive documentation. So if you click in, this is actually documentation of the whole library. You can click into any of these and the live code editor will open up with an example that you can actually modify. Let's go ahead and go back to the main site. And if we go to new, we can open up a blank template. If you save any of the sculptures, um, one thing to note is that they will go into profile and then you can access any of the things that you've created in your profile, go back to them, edit the code, and you can also share them really easily. Embedding them as an iframe or as a full screen version, uh, and even a version that will open up to the live code editor like this. But let's go ahead and get started. So one thing I wanted to note is that the programming language is JavaScript, and we're actually including Shader Park as a library in this code editor. And you can actually bring Shader Park into your existing websites, and we have examples of how to do that. Links to it are within the main page of the website. So we're going to start by looking at some of the core primitive geometries that we can make. Let's play around with the radius of the sphere. You'll notice that the coordinate space fits nicely from 0 to 1. We also have a box. Here we're setting it so that the depth is 0.2. We have a torus. We can change the radius and also the thickness of the torus. And if we want it to face towards the camera, we can rotate it by pi over 2. We can animate things really easily by adding time in. Since we're already animating, we can just remove the starting rotation. You also have the ability to rotate in the y or z direction. We can also create a cylinder by specifying the width and the height. For this next geometry, it's actually really helpful for us to store our coordinates into a variable. So we can use a vector 3 to store our x, y, and z into point 1. Here we're creating another point. This is so p1 is going to be our starting point, p2 is our end point to generate a line, and then for our last parameter we specify the thickness of the line. One cool thing about vectors is that if you are using the same x, y, and z coordinate, you can actually just pass in a single parameter and it'll default to having the x, y, and z as the same. Another cool thing that we can do with the vectors is to actually pass them in as parameters for our primitive geometries. So since box takes an x, y, and z, we can use a vector 3. The next thing to look at is how we can move around our coordinate space. So here we're displacing point 3 to the right. And that translation will affect everything below it. So if we draw a box, it's also shifted over to the right. The box is a little smaller than the sphere, which is why it's covered up. But what if we want the box centered at the origin? You could always displace by negative 0.5 to go back to the origin. Or if you want to just undo any changes to the coordinate space and rotations, you can just use reset. So now if we shift the sphere a little further to the right, we can see the box clearly. I'll also show you again how you can use a vector 3 to store the position, for example, into the displacement. So now the x, y, and z position are all in the vector 3 here, and we can move it around quickly. So next up we're going to look at our geometry modes, where we can use constructive solid geometry to create more complex shapes. For example, if we take the intersection and we make the box a little smaller, we're actually seeing specifically where the box and the sphere intersect one another. We can also take the difference. So we're cutting the box out of the sphere, and the order matters. So if we create the box first, and then take the difference with the sphere, now we're seeing the sphere cut out of the box. 
by default, we're actually in union mode. So if I enter in here, it'll look like nothing really changed, but let's say you were in difference before and later on you wanna switch back, you can always use it. We can also use blend to smoothly blend the edges of shapes together. And it's a bit more apparent if we shift our sphere a little bit over. You can see that smooth edge is still there. And this is one of my favorites. You can actually mix between two different shapes. So here at 0.5, we're blended halfway between the two. And if we want to start animating it, we can take the sine of time. Normally the values are from zero to one, but sine goes from negative one to one. So we're actually seeing this like blend of it as it goes beyond the cube past the sphere. If we take the n sign, which is normalized sign, we get values that are from 0 to 1. So now we're seeing a perfect blend between the box into the sphere and then the sphere back into the box. A classic demo to create in shaders is called Metaballs, uh, and I'm going to show you how easy that is to make in Shader Park. But we'll also introduce some interactivity. So we want to look at how we can actually use the mouse. So the mouse is provided as a vector 3, but it can be helpful to just displace by the mouse's x and y values um, to keep things centered in the z direction. So now we can actually just blend between the two shapes, and we have our classic Metaball demo. And that's it, just four lines of code. All right, let's brighten things up with a little color. So to add in any color, we can actually use RGB values. So the first parameter is red, the second is green, and the last is blue, all with values from zero to one. And Shader Park actually has a physically based rendering setup. So we can specify the metallic and also the shininess of the objects. And similar to the coordinate system, whenever you apply a color or a material, it applies to anything below it. So if we create another sphere, all of the coloring applies. But now we can also change the color of the second sphere, but keep the same metallic and shine properties. Similar to the mix geo function, we can also mix between the materials. So it can take on the properties of the first or the second, and that includes the color metal and shine. So now we can animate between those two, but also we can now really quickly recreate our metaball demo with color. Okay, so how do we make things interactive? So I can actually create an input and it'll generate a slider for us. And now I can pass the variable size into the size of our sphere, which will make it a lot easier for us to figure out the actual size that we want it. And once we figure it out, we can specify the default value that we want as the first parameter. Now, if we were to save our project and come back to it, it would automatically load with this size. Behind the scenes, this actually generates a uniform for us which is a way of taking external input and getting it into our shader. So we might use this, for example, to drive our animation with the scroll position, like you see on the front page of the website. We'll get into using this technique later on in some other tutorials. And if you want to change the range of the slider, we can pass in the second parameters, which are the minimum and maximum. So by default, it goes from 0 to 1, and now it goes from 0 to 2. Going back over to our references, I wanted to just quickly review some of the core things that we went over today. And also note that you can go into any of these interactive examples if you want to learn more. So we looked at some of our core primitives, how to create our shapes, how to use different construction modes between those geometries. We looked at how to displace our coordinate space and also rotate it and reset. We looked at the different material properties, so how to color objects, how to use the metal and shine and blend between those materials. And then we looked at how to animate things with time. And lastly, we added interactivity with input and mouse. One, Thanks for following along, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.